Uh, okay, so welcome everybody to the Toronto Physics Colloquium. It's a really great pleasure to have uh, Matthew McCullough from CERN joining us today. Um, just a, as a brief introduction, Matthew did his PhD at Oxford. Uh, and then uh, after a postdoc at MIT, where I actually met him for the first time, um, he moved to CERN, where he has been a permanent fixture of the theory group ever since. Um, I think it's completely fair to say that Matthew is one of our generation's uh, leading thinkers on innovative new ways of addressing really fundamental mysteries of theoretical physics, like the hierarchy problem. Um, and he does this mostly theoretically, but also through his work on the physics of future colliders and in advocating for new experiments. So it's a really great pleasure to have him here to tell us about what I think is a very exciting new idea. Um, and he'll tell you about this. Uh, and just as a reminder, um, Matthew loves taking questions during his seminars, so please submit your questions uh, via the Q&A uh, app thingy during the talk, and I will pass them on um, whenever possible. Uh, and then at the end of the seminar, we'll have a sort of uh, session where you can ask your questions by voice and we'll unmute you and so forth. So during the seminar, please use the Q&A thing. Um, okay, so with that introduction, Matthew, take it away. Um, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction, David. Um, so yeah, so uh, I'm very grateful to have received the invitation to give the colloquium at Toronto. I'm very disappointed to not be there in person. Um, <clears throat> currently CERN is in level red, which means we're not allowed to travel at all. And so it's, it's a real shame I'm not there, but I hope I can, I can visit the the department in, in the future at some point. And so today I'm going to talk about this uh, recent work, which I think is actually um, <clears throat> quite well suited to a colloquium style because it was really uh, uh, draws on, on different areas that I'm not necessarily expert in, from cosmology to some notions in condensed matter, and applies them to particle physics. And in fact, this work was inspired out of teaching um, a course on statistical field theory a few years back. And <clears throat> this is work I did with, with my collaborator, Chan Judici, who's uh, uh, the head of the theory department here at CERN, and Tavong Yu, who's a, a postdoc at CERN, but due to take up a faculty position at King's College London. So this work, we called it self-organized localization, and it's all based around um, questions related to um, what we call naturalness, which I will come to, uh, I will try to explain, and criticality, which is the... the <clears throat> The phenomena of of a system being, you know, uh, at the transition between two different phases of uh, of matter. Um, okay, so naturalness. I want to try and give a broad, as broad an introduction as I can to to the puzzle of naturalness without being too technical. And in fact, I'll try and keep this talk relatively broad until the last sort of ten minutes, where where uh, things will become a little bit more technical. But I think I'm sure everyone will be able to, fo to follow uh, those aspects as well. So one way of viewing naturalness is to, to think about an analogy. What, there are many analogies for this, but, but one of them for me that I, that I think is, is rel relatively pertinent when we view ourselves within a cosmological setting is to imagine we've sort of rented a room and uh, you know, you've rented an Airbnb or something, other, other alternatives are, are, are available, uh, somewhere to go to a conference. And you turn up to that room and you find that it's pretty cold. Um, but in fact, you find that um, from the, the thermometer on the wall that it's actually extremely close to zero degrees, to more decimal places than you can, can possibly uh, measure. And so that's, a, that's odd, but you might think, well, I've just happened to have walked into that room at a, a particular time. It's maybe it was cold and it's being warmed up and I've just walked in just as it crosses past zero degrees. But so you hang out there for a while and then you, you realize that actually nothing's changing and that even though the time is changing, the air outside might be getting warmer throughout the day, that uh, this room stays fixed at, at zero degrees, um, regardless of the outside temperature. Um, for you, as an observer, you know, the, the temperature of the room is a sort of microscopic fundamental parameter. Um, <clears throat> and there's at least one explanation for the reason that it's not changing. You can rationalize that. Um, and that's because there's just a very good thermostat and very good in insulation. And so uh, uh, it is designed in such a way that, that it can stay at a fixed temperature. But what's really bizarre is that for some reason, this room, whichever being outside, you know, the owner or landlord or whatever, has, has set this the temperature to be precisely at a phase transition for, for um, water between water and ice. And that is just really downright odd. And it, it, it begs a question. 
in this circumstance, you would, you know, write a comment on Airbnb and in, in, in the message and ask what's going on. Um, <clears throat> and of course, it's also not so so puzzling to us as physicists because there are scenarios that that arise like this all the time in the laboratory. You know, one ex there are many, many examples of boiling a kettle and so on. Um, but one example that's, that's very familiar and actually very closely related to the physics of the Higgs boson um, is superconductors. Um, <clears throat> if we consider superconductors um, uh, in a laboratory, and I think I, I hope I don't make a mistake here, but type two superconductors, then they're pretty well described. The, the, the microscopic phenomenology, not the microscopic physics that causes superconductivity. But if we look at superconductors, they're pretty well described by Ginzburg Landau theory, which has some scalar field and uh, uh, the electromagnetic vector potential. And the free energy for this theory looks like this. And this will be ringing alarm bells to, to particle physicists because this looks really very much like the Higgs sector of, of the standard model of particle physics. There's a gradient term, so I'm coupling to this, uh, uh, to the photon essentially, to the, the electromagnetic vector potential. There's a mass term, what looks like a mass term in particle physics parlay and a quartic interaction for this scalar field. But the mass squared is temperature dependent. So if we start off at high temperatures above the superconducting phase transition, it looks, the mass squared is positive, the potential looks like this. Um, if we cool, as we slowly cool it down in the laboratory, we get to the critical temperature where um, the, the material is about to become superconducting. And at that temperature, this mass squared is essentially zero. And then if we keep cooling it, um, the, the effective mass squared, this is again using particle physics terminology, so I'm, I apologize to my condensed matter colleagues if this is um, not very accurate. Um, the effective mass squared has become negative. And so a, a non-zero expectation value for this scalar field turns on throughout the material and it essentially spontaneously breaks um, uh, the U1 symmetry um, associated with electromagnetism. So in particle physics language, this is like the, the photon becoming uh, massive. Of course, there's a lot more to it than this and there's a lot more behind, going on behind the scenes um, involving BCS theory. But this is just a, a sketch. And what that means is that in, a, in, 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 in the laboratory, we can take a... a a bit of superconductor and we can uh, tune the temperature by hand or maybe with some feedback loop that we that we um, uh, create in the laboratory so that the the superconductor sitting just where that mass squared is effectively zero sitting right at the phase transit phase transition and that this is very useful for many different things for sensing small fluctuations and, and it's used in a wide array wide array of of settings um, <clears throat> But in some sense, with the Higgs sector of this standard model of particle physics, that's what it looks like. And I'll come back to this later. But um, we've walked into this room, we've measured certain parameters, which I will discuss, and we find that they're very close to a phase transition. Of course, the temperature of our universe has not stayed the same, right? It's not been fine -tuned, finely tuned to be stuck at some value. Um, and what that means, what that implies then is that we're not really talking about this analogy breaks down when we talk about temperatures. What I've discussed here is, is, is really in, in terms of a temperature. But one should really think more um, uh, about a broader phase diagram for, for things like superconductors. This is for a type one superconductor, where you know at, at some fixed temperature, or as, as the temperature is evolving somehow, um, one can fine tune other background parameters. In this case, it could be a background magnetic field and you can fine tune it whatever temperature you're at, fine tune it to sit right at the phase transition between, um, uh, 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 right at the superconducting phase transition. And so this is a little bit more analogous to what we've observed in particle physics. Um, <clears throat> And it, it suggests that, that maybe there maybe are other background fields. They're not magnetic fields, but other background fields that control various properties, various fundam you know, apparently fundamental parameters in particle physics. And maybe those background fields have been somehow set such that the standard model of particle physics um, in, in various aspects that I'll come to soon um, uh, looks like it's critical. Um, so I've, I, I've anticipated this slide. Um, so yeah, so you know, if, as, as observers, our room is the universe, at least the bit that's acceptable to, or accessible to us, which is the, the uh, uh, everything inside our Hubble horizon. Um, and somehow it looks like we've walked into it, we've measured a bunch of things, and it turns out that they are very close to criticality. And so this analogy with walking into you know, an Airbnb room is, is, is is sort of similar, except the criticality isn't really with respect to temperature. It's with respect to some other fundamental parameters that may or may not um, depend on other uh, uh, fields that are sort of 
analogous to uh, to what a background magnetic field is like for a superconductor, or even just a what a background magnetic field is like for a, a ferromagnet. Um, <clears throat> now, what am I talking about here? What you know, I'm talking about all these different things that are are, are critical, um, but I've not really been very clear. And so, um, I'd like to talk now about some aspects of the standard model that um, that are very puzzling to particle physicists and to, to theoretical physicists, um, that through some, they're not always described in terms that link it to criticality in the same way that we think about criticality in, in condensed matter, for instance. But I think um, they're all different faces of a sort of a criticality coin uh, in one regard or another. So there's three puzzles that I would like to, to talk about today. The first puzzle is to do with the cosmological constant. So <clears throat> the universe is, is, is entering an era or has entered an era in which um, the expansion of the universe is dominated by the vacuum energy. We're sort of essentially entering a period of inflation now where if you have some background energy, vacuum energy that's relatively constant, that drives exponential inflation at, a, at the rate of Hubble. So it goes, the, the volume is expanding at a rate of e to the three Hubble times time. And this also we will come to discuss when we talk about inflation that has occurred in the past. Um, <clears throat> so that is exponential uh, uh, expansion. And Hubble scales like the square root of the, the vacuum energy. Now, it turns out that the vacuum energy in the standard model of particle physics has contributions from all different sorts of places, including the Higgs sector, where the, the vacuum energy associated with the Higgs field is um, of order the electroweak scale. Um, also from QCD, there's a contribution to the vacuum energy of order the QCD scale around the GV and so on. Yet it appears that the vacuum energy that we are measuring in nature is way, 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 way smaller than that. And now this is a real puzzle because this is sort of a question of criticality. If the vacuum energy was big, we'd have this you know, exponentially inflating explosive phase of, of nature. If the vacuum energy were um, uh, large but negative, we'd have the opposite, we'd essentially crunch. And yet somehow it seems that, that whatever contributions there are to the vacuum energy in, 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 in our vacuum, they all add up to cancel out and give a, a, a total vacuum energy, which is much, much smaller, which allows our universe to not be violently exploding or violently crunching. And this is very, very confusing. It wouldn't be so confusing if there weren't things like particles, if there weren't things like the, the Higgs sector in QCD. But um, what this implies is that somehow, even though as the temperature of the universe uh, uh, lowered through these different phase transitions and different constant pieces were picked up, um, somehow the bizarre thing is that the universe looks like it knew in advance to be able to cancel off those pieces in the end of the day, such that in our current vacuum state, um, uh, uh, the universe was not exploding or, or collapsing. So I view this as criticality. We're essentially at a, on a knife edge between these two very violent phases. This is known as the cosmological constant problem. It's sometimes phrased in different terms from what I have there, but but I'm sort of trying to paint this uh, the way I see it, which is a question of, of criticality. Another puzzle concerns um, the Higgs sector of the standard model. The Higgs sector of the standard model looks like that Mexican hat potential that I showed you for the superconductor. It looks like this. There's a, uh, it is essentially the same as this. However, as you go to, out to very large field values, the quartic coupling um, becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And then eventually, because it, because of quantum mechanics, it depends on the Higgs, it eventually becomes negative. So ultimately the, the scalar potential of the Higgs sector looks like a, a Mexican hat, but only to a certain extent. And it's more like this. It looks like a Mexican hat potential. Sorry, I didn't plot out this direction as well. But then as you go to very, very large field values, it does actually turn over again. And what that means is that we are living in this vacuum state here. And so, in principle, and uh, it would take a very, very long time, but in principle, we could tunnel out to this lower energy vacuum. So we're actually, as far as we can tell from all of the fundamental parameters that we've measured um, at the LHC, for instance, um, it seems that we are in a, a metastable state. The running, the, the, the running of the cortic alone, so this isn't the potential, but the cortic is plotted on here. And these are the sort of the sizes of the error bars. So we can see that within um, uh, uh, within a couple of sigma, we're pretty confident that actually the cortic becomes negative. So, so this, this turnover happens. And what that means then in terms of the, the fundamental parameters of the standard model is that we're in this really weird um, critical state. 
where there, there are two phases, two vacua, which can, can essentially coexist. Um, now, if that were relatively, if that were the case for a broad range of parameters, that wouldn't be so puzzling. What's really peculiar is that that is not a typical thing. If we were to, you know, if our universe had a slightly different Higgs mass or a slightly different top quark mass, for instance, then we would be in a state which may be completely stable. So the quartic never runs negative. So our, our current vacuum is absolutely stable. Um, or if the top quark were a bit heavier, then the quartic would run negative almost immediately. And so the, our, our current um, vacuum would not be stable at all. It would just, it would vanish in the blink of an eye. But somehow the parameters of the standard model put us here, which is a, in this tiny spot. It's well, just the size of the error bars isn't important here. That's just how well we've measured it, which is impressive, but that's not the puzzle. The puzzle is that we're lying in this thin band here when we could have been here or here. Zooming in on this, you can see that we're right on the edge of metastability and stability, which is essentially uh, criticality. So that's another big puzzle in, in particle physics, is Higgs metastability. And the last um, concerns the, the mass of the Higgs boson. Um, what, for all of the other scalar fields that we've discovered in nature, one example, it's not unique, but one example is pions. We can calculate their properties like their expectation value, what the size of the order parameter is, or their mass um, <clears throat> um, from some more fundamental theory, like in, in the case of the pions, it's QCD. And when we calculate these properties within the more fundamental theory, everything follows almost naive dimensional analysis, um, you know, using sort of engineering dimensions plus symmetries. There's no surprises. The order parameter for the pions is, as you'd expect from dimensional analysis, of order the QCD scale divided by the QCD gauge coupling at that scale. The masses of the pions are, are light. They're, they're light, relatively light particles because they are the pseudo Goldstone bosons of some approximate symmetry, which is only broken by the quark masses. Everything follows, follows uh, very uh, simply. On the contrary, with the Higgs, it's what's very odd is that we haven't seen, unlike for the pions, we haven't seen that next layer of reality yet, but the LHC has told us that that more fundamental theory within which we will be able to calculate these quantities is actually at relatively high energy scales. It's not at the electroweak scale, but at the TeV scale or above. And furthermore, there's no symmetries that we see even with the, within the standard model um, that can allow to have a big separation between these two scales without fine tuning some parameters. So again, it's like the, the, the Higgs expectation value and the Higgs mass are critical. They're much lower, they're much closer to zero than they would typically be if you were to just throw a dart at parameter space. And so it's like the Higgs mass squared really in a very strong analogy with those with a superconductor has sort of been fine tuned to be much closer to zero than it would have typically been um, if, if you were just uh, uh, picking parameters at random in whatever that UV, what, sorry, whatever that more fundamental theory would be. This is known as the hierarchy problem. So traditionally, these questions are considered sort of independently, and we have different symmetries or, or speculations that can maybe explain uh, all of them, um, rarely linked in any way. But this led myself and my collaborators, Jan and Tavong, to sort of ask, you know, well, what if there's this, this common thread of criti criticality? What if it's telling us that there's a sort of a more general phenomenon going on in nature that we haven't appreciated before, that is sort of driving fundamental, seemingly fundamental parameters towards critical values, contrary to the naive expectation, which is the usual sort of we call Wilsonian expectation that, that things would are typically not critical because why would nature choose that uh, special parameter point? And this led us to think about inflation. I'm gonna explain this graphic by the way, uh, um, uh, when we get to the end of this, uh, 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 the end of this discussion. But this brings me to, inflation, because this is one ingredient in terms of uh, the evolution of parameters and things like this in the early universe that we rarely link to the evolution of parameters in, in, the, in fundamental physics. And so this led us to think, well, maybe we've been overlooking something or maybe missing some sort of general phenomenon that we could have actually picked up um, uh, how, you know, and to, to understand where all of this criticality is coming from. Uh, Matthew, sorry, yeah. before you move on, just a really quick question from the audience. So regarding the metastability point in condensed matter, when we have a negative quartic term, one typically yeah. adds a phi six term with positive coefficient to bound the fringe from below. Perhaps I missed this point, but it seems this is not done here, question mark. Yeah. Yes, so we don't, so indeed, so this isn't a, a, 
So you could add that to make it bounded from below, but we believe it should be bounded from below, but we don't know what the fundamental theory is at those very high energy scales. And so we don't know what happens. It presumably is bounded from below, but we can only calculate within the standard model so far. And then we hit, for instance, the Planck scale where we know the standard model breaks down. So in principle, yes, you know, the fact that we haven't decayed yet suggests that it is bounded from below. Um, but uh, uh, we don't know what happens at those energy scales. So we can make educated guesses, but we don't know for sure what kicks in. So we don't know, you know, what, if there's a, a, a Higgs to the sixth term, which could do the job like you suggest um, or not. Presumably there's something like that. Does that answer your question? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I think I think that that works. Thanks, Mike. OK, super. OK, so as I mentioned before, general relativity has solutions which support exponential expansion, which is inflation. And um, the physics of inflation actually has many um, commonalities with finite temperature physics, which, again, sort of links through conceptually to some of the things I've been discussing about that are more familiar from uh, uh, from condensed matter theory, condensed matter physics. Um, and that's essentially because the, you can think of, of inflation as having a sort of a temperature that the horizon bounds, the, the essentially puts a boundary condition on modes that you can have, which then makes the physics very much analogous to being at finite temperature. And that finite temperature is known as the Gibbons Hawking temperature. The theory of inflation is, is not fully understood. It is not something that is set in stone yet, but one early piece of it is known as the stochastic approach, which is developed by people like Starobinsky and Linde and, and Vilenkin and others. Um, and it was sort of an ansatz at that time, but re more recently quantum, more robust quantum field theory calculations have confirmed many aspects of the stochastic approach, which I will come to describe in a few slides. Um, however, there's much work um, remaining to fully understand it. And I'm gonna now discuss um, uh, sorry, in a few slides, I'll discuss some puddle, puzzles that it raises. So why should particle physicists care about inflation so much? I think we're sort of obliged to be absolutely worried about uh, what inflation means for, for calculability of parameters. And the reason is the following. In most inflationary scenarios, it looks like inflation is eternal. So in eternal inflation, it's still happening right now. Um, our little bubble, our universe would just be a bubble of universe that has reheated where something like the inflaton has decayed in one patch, but there will be other patches of the universe that are still inflating. And what this does is creates a multiverse of different universes, and we would just be one of them. In each one, there might be different parameters, different forces, and so on. Why is that worrying? Well, it's worrying from the context from a sort of a statistical or quasi-statistics uh, uh, context. You know, imagine you were in a you know, in a laboratory and, and, and your colleague says, I've got a box of gas there and I've measured the velocity of one atom. And here's what it is. Um, but they don't tell you the temperature. You just know this one velocity that's, that's been measured. And they ask you, is that velocity likely or unlikely? And if you're honest with yourself, you've no idea because you've no context. Maybe they've, maybe they've, the, the, the velocity really corresponds to, you know, three over two kT. So, so it's, uh, sorry, you know, a kinetic energy of three over two kT. So it's sort of very typical, or maybe it's right out on the end of the Boltzmann tail, but you don't know because you don't know the temperature. So you can't assign any likelihood to that. Um, only if we know the sort of the, the properties of the whole statistical ensemble, can we attach any sort of likelihood to that measurement. And of course, if, uh, if your colleague were to then tell you the, the temperature, you could immediately decide whether or not that measurement of the velocity was a rare event, uh, unlikely to have happened or, or, or just typical. And I believe we're sort of in the same scenario if we think about eternal inflation, because we are measuring these fundamental parameters in the room that we've walked into, which is our universe. But we don't have context for the statistical ensemble. So we worry about things like why, why, or, you know, why is criticality showing up all over the place? Um, <clears throat> but we don't know if, in reality if all of these things can vary, you know, Higgs mass and things can vary in different parts of the multiverse, then why, um, then we can't know if what we're measuring is typical or not. One can appeal to certain aspects, like for, for instance, anthropics works well for the cosmological constant, but it doesn't really work well for the other two questions. And so we sort of want to know this, this sort of the statistics of the macroscopic 
ensemble before we can really assign sort of context to parameters. And I think this is a, a puzzle that's important when we think about eternal inflation. So we want to sort of move towards being able to do some sort of quasi statistics. Of course, we're limited. We're observers in a Hubble in a horizon. We can never access other parts of, of, of you know, inflated multiverse. Um, but we can maybe try using the stochastic formalism to, to move towards some sort of statistical understanding about what is or is not likely. And um, the way to do this is to use uh, the formalism of, of the stochastic approach, which is expected to be um, relatively accurate, at least in leading order in the dynamics of scalar fields. So suppose there's some light scalar field, I'm not going to connect it to anything related to the Higgs or anything yet, but just suppose there's some light scalar field um, in nature. So this is some light particle, but its potential is so shallow that rather than thinking about it as a particle, it's not sitting at necessarily sitting at, at a local minimum where the mass corresponds to the oscillation frequency about that minimum. It's more like a coherent, almost like Bose-Einstein condensate everywhere, and it has some potential and it can roll down that potential. Hubble, the Hubble parameter depends on that potential. Hubble just square, Hubble squared scales like uh, the vacuum energy, so the, the scalar field potential. And the stochastic, stochastic approach um, treats the scalar field like it's in, almost like it's in fin um, uh, finite temperature at essentially the Gibbons Hawking temperature, and it has fluctuations. So it walks around its potential sort of like a, a random walk and following a sort of Langevin-like uh, description. The average of all of those random walks gives you the Fokker-Planck equations. This is all getting very, uh, um, analogous to, to, to um, various aspects of statistical mechanics. And now the, the, the quantum noise, the, sort of the size of the fluctuations depends on Hubble and it depends on, the, on um, Planck's constant. And um, there's some slow roll uh, term to determining how, it, how the, the scalar field distribution evolves. P is just the distribution of the scalar field. So the probability of measuring certain values of that scalar field in different patches of, of the multiverse. And <clears throat> this term here, it just describes how it classically rolls down its potential. It wants to go to minimize the energy and go to the bottom. And the term on the right just determines the, the time evolution of that scalar field distribution. So this is essentially the, the nuts and bolts of the stochastic approach. Um, we actually want to know the volume average distribution because um, as that any dynamics of the distribution of, of the scalar field is, is playing out, the universe is also expanding. Uh, at a rate of e to the three h times t, h being the Hubble parameter. And so we want the volume weighted because if some um, uh, uh, scalar field value occupies a lot of volume, then that's probably the most likely va uh, value that you would measure. So this is no longer a probability distribution, but we want to know about the volume weighted probability distribution, we call this p. And then there's an additional term here, which accounts for the Hubble expansion. So bit patches where the scalar field is high up the potential inflate more rapidly. And so um, we have to account for that because they're inflating more rapidly than the patches further where the scalar field is further down the potential. And so that's accounted for with this term here. And so something peculiar can happen in, in, in inflation. And the peculiar thing is that scalar field distributions can behave in very bizarre ways. The reason is the following. Suppose you started with some scalar field value. I've got, you know, just showing the scalar field. This is the, the potential of the scalar field as a function of the scalar field. So this is low values and high values. Suppose we start with some value. Classically, according to this term, that the, the scalar field would just roll down the potential like a ball rolling down the hill. But the distribution would sort of broaden while it's doing that because of this term here. There are small, you know, what is analogous to finite temperature fluctuations as it rolls down this, this potential. So there, this we, even if you start with one value, it will start the distribution will start to broaden because there are different fluctuations in different patches. But the peculiar thing that can happen is that um, a rare fluctuation that actually takes the scalar field up the potential can occur, according to this term here, um, because of this essentially finite temperature effect. But then if it's fluctuated up the potential, that patch inflates more rapidly because of inflation, because the, the inflationary rate just depends on the height of the potential. And so what can happen is that ultimately, because of this term here, um, uh, the scalar field distribution can ultimately actually climb up a potential. So from an energy considerations, you know, in flat in Minkowski space, this seems totally insane, right? That, that the, the distribution of scalar fields, the most likely values of scalar field to measure is actually moving up a potential. But that can occur because those patches that have a rare fluctuation up are rewarded 
um, even though they're rare events, they're rewarded by a very large volume expansion. And so they that can win out depending on the parameters. Now, this sort of dynamics leads to many puzzles. One of them is known as the youngness paradox. I think this is the most um, striking one where patches that have, have where inflation has ended um, a lot for a longer time ago um, have not been inflating exponentially for as long as compared to patches that are younger. And so you even get this, depending on how you calculate things, um, these weird paradoxes where the number of patches that is that have a uh, that that are half as old as our patch, you know, so not 13 billion years, but you know, six or seven billion years old, um, is a factor that there's the numer the number of those patches is e something like e to the 60 times greater than the number of patches of our age. So this is known as the youngness paradox. So this formalism is not without its puzzles, but nonetheless, I think it's it's interesting to play with, and maybe that the, these paradoxes. Um, will ultimately be explained once we get a better understanding of the, the quantum mechanics going on here. Um, but we were sort of a little bit brash, I guess, I guess, in going ahead and sort of exploring this as it may apply to particle physics, even though it's clearly as yet an incomplete framework. It works very well for some aspects, but has these enormous paradoxes in other aspects. Some, some motivation for, for this uh, Potential foolhardy, uh, foolhardiness comes from thinking about you know developments that have been made in the past when various theories were not completely understood. You know, infinities in quantum field theory worried people for a long time and made them think that it was wrong. But actually, um, it just required a leap of the imagination to understand how to conceptualize those inf those infinities and understand what they mean. And similarly with quantum mechanics and so on. So, so even though we're aware that this formalism um, leaves some boxes unchecked, um, we, we, we hope that some of the things that we find will still apply. Okay, so now I want to bring the story of, of criticality that I mentioned in the, you know, the first third of the talk and the story of, of eternal inflation, which I've just been discussing together to see whether they may have some sort of link. This is gonna be the most busy slide. I apologize for it, but I want everyone to see it, to, to know that we're doing you know, proper calculations with equations and not just sort of uh, speculating in words. So <clears throat> we assume throughout, we're assuming that there's some light scalar field, we call it phi. It has, we, we consider it over some fixed field range, which we call, call F. And we take a very general um, form for the potential for that scalar field. We don't necessarily require it to be, you know, exactly a straight line or exactly a quadratic potential or something like this. We allow for some very general function, um, which we can always tailor expand um, in this ratio of phi over f, as so long as phi never gets bigger than f, like this. And we just plug it into the potential. This is the vacuum energy, the background vacuum energy that's driving inflation. And we just plug it in and we make a, an ansatz, which is that we assume that across this field range, it's a small perturbation um, compared to the that its contribution to the potential energy is a small perturbation compared to the background uh, potential energy, so the vacuum energy that's driving inflation. So we plug this into that fokker planck like equation and make it an expansion in the ratio of this to this, always self-consistency check, consistently checking that this is smaller than this. And we get this equation here, which is the same Fokker Planck equation, but just we've tidied it up a little bit. And there are two parameters, two important parameters alpha, which concerns the, the quantumness, how big the fluctuations are. So the bigger Hubble is, the bigger the finite temperature effects, and the bigger the fluctuations. And beta, which is essentially measuring the field range relative to uh, uh, the Planck, uh, uh, the, the, the Planck mass. Planck mass isn't the mass, but that's a discussion for another day. Um, and we've sort of plotted out, so if you take, for instance, a line, you know, this is just for an example, a line, or but it, this applies for any slope that's just monotonically rising, we find that there are two interesting parameter, well, sort of three interesting parameter ranges. One that we call classical, where alpha times beta, and beta here is, is sort of related to the size of the volume effects, and alpha is related to the size of the fluctuations. If alpha times beta is less than one, the distribution behaves classically, and this is the classical distribution. It rolls all the way down to the bottom of the potential as far as it can get. Um, so nothing wacky is happening. However, if alpha times beta is bigger than one, then a quantum fluctuation plus a volume effect can is bigger than a classical rolling. You see that we've normalized that so there's no parameters in here. So we've normalized the size of the classical effects to one, essentially. Alpha times beta is, is larger than one. Quantum plus, plus volume is 
bigger than classical rolling and the field distribution goes right up to the top of the potential. So it climbs, like I was saying. And if alpha squared beta is larger than one, so that's two fluctuations plus a volume effect is still larger than a classical rolling, um, then it's extremely uh, uh, peaked right at the top of the, of the potential as far as it can get. But the basic punchline is when you're in the classical regime, everything behaves like you would expect it to classically, it rolls down the potential. But in the quantum regime, these scalar field distributions actually climb up the potential as high as they can get. Okay, so in the last 15 minutes here, I want to apply this to the, the three criticality questions that I had um, uh, uh, outlined earlier. So the first um, concerns um, the Higgs metastability. So the fact that the Higgs quartic coupling seems to be critical. We have, uh, this isn't a very good plot here, but on, on the black line here, I'm showing a phase where you have the, the minimum that we call the UV minimum out at large field values. And also you can't see it so well here, but also a local minimum, which is the one that we live in. So this is that example where I showed the plot where there's a local minimum and then the potential turns over and goes down again. Um, <clears throat> so that's what we want to explain using inflation, or at least to try to maybe not explain, but rationalize using inflation. So we consider some scenario where, where we have that scalar field and we have, uh, it has a potential, which is this, this generic function here. So it can move around on its potential, um, but that it also, um, the higgs quartic interaction depends on the value of that scalar field. It could depend on it linearly or quadratically, it doesn't really matter. So as long as you're working within this relatively general parameterization. And so we plot out the potential, um, always minimizing the Higgs. And so when the scalar field value, so, so the, the scalar field, the coupling to the Higgs is such that a larger scalar field means the, the, the quartic interaction becomes smaller and smaller and will pass through zero at some point. So when the, the scalar field is large and negative, the quartic coupling of the Higgs is positive and big. And so there's no turnover of that potential. The, the Higgs cortex stays positive the whole way up. So then the only local minimum, the only min, you know, vacuum for the Higgs, the only minimum for the Higgs field is that one at small field values. So we start there and that's the only one that exists. And then we keep increasing the, the scalar field and the Higgs cortex interaction is getting smaller and smaller. And then eventually we hit this regime, which is like the standard model where the Higgs cortex is positive at small field values. But it, the Higgs cortex is starting off small enough that, that those quantum effects actually drive it negative at some point. And so that then there are two vacua. There's the vacuum that is um, at small field, field values, but also because that potential is turning over, sorry, like I, I showed earlier, um, there's another vacuum that the Higgs field could tunnel out to, which is at lower field values and is presumably um, as was pointed out earlier, presumably bounded from below, but we don't know what, what does that. So there are two phases that can exist for the Higgs. And then if we keep increasing the scalar field, the value of the scalar field, then um, that small field vacuum disappears because the Higgs cortic is now starting at zero or, or is negative. So there's only the, the one at large field value. So you can see these three different regimes, red, black, and blue uh, shown here in red. There's only the, the minimum here for the Higgs field. In uh, blue, there's only the one out here. And um, uh, in this black line here, there's both. Now, the important point is that um, as you plot this out, you know, when the Higgs field goes to this, to, to the large field values, that gives a large, through this coupling here, a large correction to the, the potential for this scalar field. So as you plot out the effective potential, always minimizing the Higgs in, in either of the vacua, the highest point on the potential is actually the critical point where that the infrared vacuum, the one at small field values is about to vanish. So where the, the Higgs quartic coupling is just critical. And it just so happens that that's the highest point. So this effect of scalar fields climbing potentials means that the scalar field will, during inflation would climb all the way to the top of this potential. And it would predict, the distribution would be peaked up here. So it would predict that we would, in our universe, if it were typical amongst all of the universes that have been, been created during inflation, it would predict that we would measure the most likely value of parameters that we are going to measure are those where the Higgs quartic coupling is critical, where we're in a metastable phase close to being um, uh, uh, completely um, unstable. And so the, this, you know, and, and you can see that if you were to zoom out, then what this 
reveals is like a, a, a discontinu a first order discontinuity because what we're getting here is essentially a first order phase transition between these two two phases. Um, and so it's a critical point. And so this 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 mechanism of scalar field climate potentials could actually explain why we've observed this very peculiar fact, which is that the, the standard model Higgs quarter coupling um, and well, the mass and, and the, 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 the top quark mass are conspired just to be at this point, which is, is, is critical and the, where there are two phases that can coexist. And so plotting out, there are details here in the calculation, precisely how wide that distribution is and where it sits and the potential depends on the Hubble parameter. So we make different predictions depending on the value of, of Hubble during inflation. But overall, the prediction is that uh, we would live here um, on the, the, the edge of stability or sorry, no, that we would live somewhere in this region, depending on Hubble. But if Hubble were of order 10 to the 10 GeV, for instance, during inflation, we would live somewhere along this line here. So it gives an explanation for, for why the Higgs quartic couple, or at least a, a rational a rationalization for why the Higgs quartic is, is, uh, is critical. The second application I'd like to discuss is what we know is what we call the hierarchy problem, which is that the Higgs mass squared appears to be critical. So if we play a similar sort of game, so we don't do anything special, this field is light and ex exists as a background scalar field during inflation that has some potential. And instead of scanning the Higgs cortic, we allow it to scan the Higgs mass squared. So this is the effect of Higgs mass squared in here. And for large fields values, that mass squared is large and negative. And for large negative, um, uh, field values that Higgs mass squared is large and positive. And so again, we can plot out these phases, always keeping in mind that we're, we're not varying the Higgs cortic coupling. So that cortic coupling has that same metastability prediction. So, sorry, the same metastability observation for now, we're, we're just explaining this thing at this point. And so the Higgs mass squared at this point. So this does eventually run. What's interesting is if you start off with the Higgs mass squared, very, very large and positive, then, um, the, the phase where the Higgs sits here um, becomes more and more stable. So we can stay in that, that phase here. However, because the Higgs cortic does eventually run negative, um, the potential does turn over. So always there's the, this phase here, which we call the UV, UV phase, where the Higgs field is sitting out at whatever its presumed um, metastable minimum is out here. Then if we increase phi, the Higgs mass squared is becoming less and less large and positive. It eventually passes through zero. And then it becomes more and more negative. And when it becomes so negative that it's larger than the, the, the corresponding scale, energy scale, which the Higgs cortic has run negative, um, there's no minimum here. So the, 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 the metastable minimum for the, the Higgs that we live in actually vanishes entirely. So that IR phase, which is what I'm referring to this metastable minimum as here, um, completely vanishes. And again, because if the Higgs field is sitting out here, then this gives a contribution to the, the potential for this phi field already. And so if we plot out just the total potential energy for this phi field, um, the phase diagram looks like this. The, the highest point on the potential is the point at which the Higgs mass squared is negative and of order um, the instability scale. So again, what this what this is that the, the, the distribution of field values would be just such that and it would evolve to this point during inflation, there would be just such that in a typical universe, you would expect to measure the Higgs mass squared just being critical. Now, this doesn't go the whole way to explaining the position, the, 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 why the electroweak scale is where it is, because the electroweak scale is not a 10 to the 10 GeV, and that is the instability scale for the Higgs. So we need to add, you know, to get this theory to reduce the, the electroweak scale even further, we need to reduce the scale at which the standard model um, Higgs cortic becomes negative. And to do that, we introduced some, some extra fermions that couple to the Higgs. And so that's essentially a free parameter. But the important point is that you don't have to fine tune parameters for that to happen. It, can ha it happens through a quantum mechanical effect that is very stable, can have large um, scale separations. So this doesn't go all the way to explaining. It explains the Higgs mass criticality. It doesn't go all the way to explaining why the Higgs mass is, is quite so small within the standard model itself, but it certainly gives uh, a plausible route towards understanding that from inflation, from cosmology. And then in the, my last five minutes here, I'd like to discuss something that's, that's super duper speculative, um, which we didn't anticipate, but I think is, is interesting enough that it's sort of, and, and sort of thought provoking enough that it's worth uh, uh, discussing and, I, and we put it in the paper. And 
This concerns what happens when uh, on, a, on a different type of scalar potential, which has two different phases. So for that scalar field phi, we solved for just out of interest for a different sort of potential where one of the phases has a very shallow gradient. It can be, you know, for this purposes, for these purposes is flat. It doesn't have to be exactly flat. And then in another phase, um, like in all of, you know, in, in all of these phase diagrams, where there are two vacua for some background field and they determine the slope of the potential for the, the scalar field phi. Um, on this other phase, um, the gradient is much, much larger. And we allow for the fact that the scalar field can tunnel at this point here. So just like um, on the, this potential here, where the Higgs was, was the, 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 um, the field that the scalar field was coupled to, and it can tunnel, the Higgs can tunnel from the IR phase, you know, here out to here at this point. And the same was true for the cortic, and this is a very general phenomenon. We assume that at this point here, which is not parametrically close to the crossing point, um, the scalar field can tunnel from here to here onto this different vacuum. And what was really peculiar is that we solved this Fokker-Planck-like equation on this potential under some conditions that weren't fine-tuned, but some, uh, some non-trivial boundary conditions that required some flux of field, non-zero derivatives here and here. What we find is that the distribution on the, the, the red potential was, as you'd expect, it was sort of relatively flat. Um, the field was essentially delocalized by the finite temperature effects. So it's sort of uh, a spread out over, over this potential, which you can see plotted here. This is the field distribution um, on the right-hand side and the potential on the left. But what was really, really weird is that the potential on this um, here, phase V, the scalar field distribution wasn't peaked you know, down at the bottom or up at the top, or what we expected, it wasn't peaked at the point where, where the field can tunnel down here. It was peaked at exactly the same height as this potential here. So the scalar field distribution here was peaked right, is peaked right there, um, where the two vacua have the same energy. Now, the same vacuum energy. Now this, in retrospect, is not surprising because this is inflation and the inflationary rate um, depends on the vacuum energy. And so if you're going to be in equilibrium, you know, in the, if the two phases are going to be in, in, in equilibrium in the sense that they're in steady state and there's to be some non-zero probability to find yourself on this phase, then if, there's, if they're in steady state, then they're the total volume, the ratio of the volume in this phase versus this phase is not changing with time. And so if you can find yourself on this phase with some probability that's, that's non-zero, and you can find yourself on this phase with some probability that's non-zero, if you find yourself on this phase, you're most likely to find yourself at a point that is inflating at the same rate as the other phase. So it's a form of, 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 of equilibrium, but it's not a sort of the, the, the one that we would normally expect. And so it's a sort of an inflationary equilibrium where the, the bubbles of different phases are in equilibrium the whole time. The, num the, 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 the total volume occupied by them, if you take the ratio of those volumes, even though they're both exponentially growing, that ratio is not changing. It leads to a sort of weird inflationary memory where this phase knows, sort of remembers about this phase, even though it's out of causal contact, because the tunneling point is at a very different uh, uh, place. It's sort of a weird inflationary memory where the probability distribution on this phase um, knows about the height of this potential. So this is a really peculiar thing, but we did uh, uh, ultimately understand the physics of what was going on. And so we hope that this could lead an understanding of the, the cosmological constant problem. And the reason for that is that um, there's a symmetry uh, which many of you may have heard of, supersymmetry, and another one which is a sort of subset of that, which is known as R symmetry. And this is the only symmetry I know of, or I think that any my, some of my collaborators know of, that can actually enforce the cosmological constant to be zero. So we imagined it, it really enforces that if you have R symmetry and supersymmetry, that, that space time looks Minkowski like. And so um, one can imagine a theory which is supersymmetric where super, there's a phase which is completely supersymmetric and R-symmetric, which we'll call this phase H, and then a different phase, a different vacuum, you know, so there are multiple vacuum, where supersymmetry is badly broken in that vacuum, and this would be our vacuum here. I see there's a question. Oh, okay, see you, Paul, thanks for joining. Um, and a vacuum that is um, uh, not supersymmetric at all. So supersymmetry and R-symmetry are badly broken. Now we imagine during inflation that there's some other contribution to the potential, which is positive, 
which then when inflation ends tunnels down to a theory which a vacuum which is super symmetric and r symmetric as well so what would happen is that during inflation the vacuum structure would look like this and this would be the vacuum that we live in and thanks to this localization that on this vacuum the the field distribution would be peaked here at the crossing point between the two but then after inflation everything gets set down to um uh, down to zero because the theory in this vacuum has become completely supersymmetric and r symmetric so it has to be minkowski but we live on this vacuum which is not supersymmetric or r symmetric so um there's no symmetry in this vacuum to have zero or very small um, uh, cosmological constant, yet this inflationary memory effect means that the field values are peaked at the crossing point. So they're peaked in our vacuum at the same height as the other vacuum, but the other vacuum has to be at height zero because of symmetries. So this is a very sort of, uh, in my mind, very pro provocative way of thinking about the cosmological constant that maybe inflation plus supersymmetry in another vacuum um, led to a memory effect which is forced our cosmological constant would be way, way smaller than we would have naively expected it to be. Now, we didn't flesh out all the details here. We didn't build a fully fledged concrete model that has this vacuum structure, but we believe that it, it should be possible and we're, we're thinking about it. Okay. So I should uh, I should wrap up. I'm sorry I've run over uh, a little bit. So my 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 I would say that whatever your thoughts are on eternal inflation and the the, the these weird things that it predicts like the multiverse and 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 um, various paradoxes like the youngness paradox and so on that maybe make you a little bit queasy and they certainly still be a bit queasy um, I think combining the dynamics of eternal inflation with questions surrounding criticality and the standard model is, is very interesting and I think perhaps this form of localization which can localize scalar fields during inflation such they um, are you know, taking values such that the, the quantum field theory that they're coupled to becomes critical. Um, this phenomenon, which seems to be uh, uh, possible within the, the context of, of the stochastic approach to inflation, at least, um, could potentially offer answers as to why our universe appears to be so determinedly critical, um, despite the fact that all attempts so far based on, on symmetries have, have failed to explain why that is the case. And I'll leave my... Uh, uh, I'll leave it there and apologize again for running a bit over. Thanks.